postdoctoral seminar is uh, Dr. David Stupsky, uh, which is postdoc in Van Bruegel lab, the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Stupsky received his PhD in Ruth Schilder's lab, the Department of Biology and Entomology at Penn State University, where he studied the comparative metabolic uh, and biomechanical physiology of dragonflies, most bees and flies. Is a biophysical ecologist primarily interested in how insects physiologically, behaviorally, and biomechanically handle the physical challenges presented by their ecosystems. At UNR, he's working to reverse engineer uh, the search algorithms of fly, uh, flies used to find the locations of others. So the today's topic of David is uh, sorry. Uh, developing virtual smell reality for insects. So I'm leaving the stage for David. Awesome. Thank you, Stan. All right, y'all. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, so I think these have been a lot of fun. And so I've been pretty excited to show up to most of these to find out what other people are working on on campus especially since with the pandemic and everything, there's not a whole lot of like common form for us to come together and know who's around campus and who's working on what flavors of problems. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is some of the things I've been working on since I came to UNR um, on developing smirtual, smirtual, virtual smell reality for insects. Um, but one thing I've seen other sort of like postdoc groups do for their seminars is to do a PhD on a slide challenge. And I kind of like that. Um, so the kind of flavors of questions I, I come from are from the comparative metabolic and physiology world. So I study things like how natural variation in lipid metabolism um, affects dragonfly biomechanical performance. I've tried to understand how these moths that um, they warm themselves up to fly, they heat up their brains to really high temperatures, trying to understand how that affects their ability to perform basic biomechanical maneuvers um, with this sort of robotic flower hawk moth system. And I've worked on trying to understand the metabolic constraints of honeybee clusters. Um, so trying to build heat transfer models for how honeybees make it out through the winter to estimate how many calories it should take for them to heat their homes under different projected climate scenarios. But sort of the underlying themes to the kinds of questions I like to work on is I like to work on things that fly because I think flight is one of the coolest evolutionary adaptations. And I like to work on insects because they have virtually no paperwork um, and I don't have the patience to do this sort of similar work for things like birds that have backbones. So the basic question and problem I've been working on since I've come to UNR is one that sounds fairly simple, but is a deceptively complex, which is how does an insect know where a smell is coming from? Um, so this has proven to be a really challenging thing to engineer into robotic systems. Um, so if there's some sort of airborne chemical and gets dispersed by turbulent airflow, over large spatial scales um, and developing an algorithm or trying to reverse engineer how bugs are so good at finding the source has been a key problem for engineering, especially if you can imagine we wanna develop robots that can go find a chemical leak in a condemned building that's not safe for people or there's a chemical leak in a place that's heavily wooded so aerial surveillance isn't an option. Um, these would be kind of applications of this system and we know insects are really good at it. And I think anybody who's ever like had a picnic or eaten anything outside knows uh, flies can find your food from a really far distance away. And so as engineers, we're kind of interested in this problem for two reasons. Um, insects solve two things really well. Um, they solve what we kind of think of as a sensitivity problem. So as far as um, sensors that can detect uh, very specific molecules, amplify that signal to something meaningful, you can't really beat something like a moth antenna. Um, so this has inspired uh, a handful of drones from groups up at U Washington to put a moth antenna on board a drone such that um, they can put some chemical that the moth is responsive to like a pheromone or a food chemical signal they measure the electrical responses of that antenna and use that signal to navigate the drone towards the source. But this doesn't solve all the problems. Um, this is only solves the ability to detect molecules in the air, which is a big challenge as well. There's also what we think of as the computation problem. 
So if you're an insect and you're out in the real world and smells are washing over you in waves, um, depending on how far you are from the source, kind of changes the input signal of that smell. So if you're really close to the source, you're constantly encountering the smell. It's sort of like a always on sort of signal. But as you get further away, um, the way the smell washes over you comes and goes in these waves with um, discrete intervals. But it's really challenging to sort of like describe the statistics and create replicated airflows to really understand what aspect of this timing, the timing of smell encounters insects use in order to sort of vector orient to where the smell is coming from. Um, and so another thing that becomes challenging is that with smell specifically, you can be very close to the source and then all of a sudden olfaction becomes a very unreliable um, sense altogether to find it. So if you're just off of the source, you'll never encounter the smell again. And this is very, very tricky to engineer robustly into uh, sort of drone systems, it's a similar algorithm. But we know is that insects um, solve this problem on extraordinarily large spatial scales. So that video of smoke blowing over the flies um, is a spatial scale of only a few centimeters. But we know from uh, catch and release experiments that insects can solve this problem over kilometer um, spatial scales. So folks have gone out into the desert outside of LA, released thousands of flies in the middle of a playa where there's virtually no visual signals. There's no organic matter around to really sort of like confound with what the fly is smelling. And they can put these just fermenting um, fruit traps out and flies within 24 hours will navigate over a kilometer and specifically find the fruit traps and people have DNA checked to make sure that these are the same flies that they released. So it's pretty crazy that we can't engineer something that insects solve on extremely large spatial scales. Um, so we're trying to get a better sense of how to figure that out. And so when we think about this problem, there's a number of things that we think like an insect might use in order to figure this problem out that we need to be able to replicate in the lab. And the first is it needs to know where the wind is coming from, which is a talk for another day, but also a deceptively challenging problem. Um, so it needs to know where the wind is coming from. So if it gets a whiff, it knows to fly up wind. It needs uh, some sort of metric of the signal frequency at which a smell is washing over it, which is gonna give it some sense of how far it is from the odor, what kind of decisions to make um, and that kind of aspect. And that's gonna be the focus of my talk today. And it also needs to take into account what's going on in its visual field. Um, so once an insect gets kind of close to an odor source or thinks it's close, it'll switch over to vision-based navigation, which I'll show y'all in a minute. Um, so we want to be able to experimentally control all three of these things at the same time. Um, but what's particularly challenging is controlling wind and the timing of odor encounters, because if we release a real odor for the insect, um, it's the way it spreads in space is going to be naturally dependent on the wind. So we can't physically separate those two sensations very easily. Um, so our kind of first idea is to try and hack the system. So how do we separate this sort of wind stimulus and the incoming encounter of an odor stimulus? Um, and to, before we really talk about that, we have to think about the flies' uh, sense of smell. So flies smell with their antenna. There are all these small um, rugged nodules all over their antenna called sensilli, which are the homes of the neurons that detect uh, airborne molecules. And so normally a fly um, that's flying around will pick up these molecules with its antenna and they like to do things like find um, cues of fermentation because um, they're looking for things like ethanol, CO2, um, those kinds of things. But we're gonna hack the system in a little bit of a way where instead of making those antennas sensitive to uh, airborne molecules, I'm not gonna talk too much about the nuts and bolts of this, but we, we have fly lines that their antenna, these specific olfactory receptors are sensitive to red light. Um, and this has a lot of convenient properties in that insects visually have extraordinarily low detection for red light. So the insects can't really see red light, but when we activate and shine red light on these flies antennas, it activates their olfactory neurons like a normal smell would. 
So what I've been working on for the past couple months is building a system to even sort of test this. Um, so I've built this along with many lab mates, this wind tunnel system, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, that has arrays of cameras on top and it's integrated with these red light LEDs so that if I want to, I can program it to flash, stimulate those olfaction uh, neurons with the red light, um, all while doing a couple of other cool tricks. And so we also want to be able to control the wind environment. Um, so we built this wind tunnel with a six by six fan array. Um, and so what this allows us to do is to, uh, uh, we can dynamically control each one of these fans individually. And that allows us to do things like we can create a very laminar flow in the wind tunnel. We can um, activate them haphazardly, constantly turning them on and off to create all kinds of chaotic and turbulent airflows as well to see how the wind environment changes how an insect navigates for an odor. But the really cool part is, if I can change this, oh God, no. One second while it loads. Okay, there we go. Um, is that the, we use this uh, array of 12 cameras. We can take the feed all at once. Um, and we use an open source machine learning platform. I'm happy to talk uh, more shop on that for if y'all are interested, but we can in real time track the trajectory of a fly moving in this wind tunnel, which becomes extraordinarily important for if we want to really understand the specific timing of events, um, how the fly's motion changes with this sort of input signal. Um, we can do that in real time on millisecond timescales, which is also important because flies are doing incredibly complex behaviors on timescales of less than a second. So we really need to be under, able to understand the nuance really quickly. So 3D tracking is fairly challenging it, getting it to do it in real time um, for a fly in a volume that's 1 billion times larger than the fly was pretty cool. Um, and so what this allows us to do is we can set up any sort of trigger zone within the wind tunnel. Um, so if a fly in real time passes through any sort of predefined area under any sort of predetermined conditions, we can flash this array of red lights um, and give it that quick impulse of smell. And we can make it so that we can give it a trained impulse. So a bunch of up and down uh, quick blinks. We can give it a long blink. I'm only gonna talk about long blink data today. Um, but we can make this modular in basically any way we want, um, which is proven to be pretty useful for a number of problems. And so what we do is we sort of, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this figure because a lot of figures that come later in the talk are going to look a lot like this. But we take thousands and thousands of these trajectories. Um, we can map them in space in the wind tunnel. So if you look at the little cartoon figure of the wind tunnel, the X dimension is gonna be sort of the longest dimension, the length of long which the wind blows. Um, Z dimension goes up in space, Y dimension to the side. And so we can make these heat maps of where the flies like to hang out in space. And this is not a particularly interesting one, but the what I want you to see is on the top is the X versus Y component. So it's a slice as if we're looking down on the wind tunnel. And on the bottom one is the XZ component. So it says if you're looking to the wind tunnel from the side. And the hotter the color means that flies like to hang out there more. So this was an experiment in which we didn't really put anything in the wind tunnel. So the flies are ambiently searching everywhere. Um, so what we're looking for is that we know flies have some stereotyped responses that when they encounter an odor. And the primary one is that when they first encounter an odor, they turn upwind because that's sort of the natural response. If the wind has changed, now they all of a sudden encounter a smell, they fly into the wind. And if they lose track of that odor, they fly to the left and right to catch them, try and figure out where the plume was. At some point, they collect enough information about the odor source that they'll switch to visual navigation and find, look for any visual object in the field. And so I want to just show we can actually manipulate this in our wind tunnel. Um, so there's two things that we're going to play around with this for this first set of experiments. The first is simply a visual feature on the tunnel floor. And the second is an odor release port that's going to stream uh, volatile ethanol into the wind tunnel in a narrow plume. 
And so if we run one of these experiments and I only put the visual feature in, the flies really don't care. They sort of ambiently navigate everywhere in the wind tunnel. They're just searching around, um, can't seem to find anything. And so this is like a compilation of a few thousand of these sort of flight trajectories of flies. But if we put something like an odor in there, then the, all of a sudden the flies uh, hang out really tightly in an area around where the odor is released. So you can think of this graph as being all along the tunnel. So there's this ethanol plume that spans the whole distance as the wind blows it down through the tunnel. The flies can find that plume, they hang out in that plume, and they um, have a great time in that plume. But we get this sort of weird behavior if I include both an odor and a visual signal at the same time. The flies will leave the plume and go down to start searching for that visual object on the tunnel floor. And so this is a simple behavior, but because we're working with a fairly complex system, we thought this behavior would be the easiest thing to start working with to see if we can make some sort of virtual smell reality work. We should be able to elicit this object approaching behavior. Um, because in the absence of any smell, the flies truly don't care about it. Um, so the basic way we kind of set up experiments is I designed some trigger zone in the tunnel that I built based off of kind of about the statistics we see of where flies like to hang out with a real plume. And if a fly crosses into that zone, we either give it a pulse of real light. Um, so I actually pulse the red LED array to trigger their sense of smell or the flies trigger the zone, but I never actually flash the lights because for a lot of reasons, the flies behave differently depending on where they are in the tunnel. So we just wanna use that as a control to make sure that any effect we see isn't the flies speeding up or slowing down as a function of where they are simply flying within the wind tunnel. Um, and what we found is that if I set up this trigger zone like this, these flies will go down and approach the object. So keep in mind that this is an experiment where there's no odor actually releasing to the tunnel whatsoever. We purify all the air in that room. There should be nothing floating around in there, but the flies will go explore that object once we compile hundreds and hundreds of these flash events. And if I run an experiment where I never ever flash the red lights, not even once, then the flies don't care about that object at all. So we have this really cool proof of concept that we can use this red light flashing um, and these red light sensitive channels uh, engineered into the fly's antenna to make the flies really think that there's a smell going on in the wind tunnel. But some other things kind of happen if we really look at what's going on with the individual fly's behaviors and whether or not these are truly, um, these flies are initiating behaviors that we think are stereotypical of searching for an odor. And so the first one I mentioned is that when a fly thinks it smells something, it immediately will turn up wind if it wants to go find it. Um, so the way to think about this graph is on the y-axis is the x velocity. So how, if the fly is flying upwind or downwind and how quickly. And on the y, the x-axis is time up until I start the flash. It's a 500 millisecond pulse and the fly's behavior after the flash. And so what we find is if I only take flies that were flying downwind when they triggered that red LEDs, we find this very quick on a sort of 250 millisecond time scale um, acceleration into the opposite direction. And for our subset of flies that didn't get a real flash of light, they sort of are flying to the end of the tunnel and turning around. So they're not actually responding to no light. It's that flies after flying for a full second trans like uh, make the full transit of the wind tunnel and simply slow down to turn around. Um, and so that's cool. So this is like our first like, oh, we can really take advantage of this system. It looks like we're getting some stereotypical uh, behaviors. So let's keep exploring. Um, so if I take the subset of flies that were instead flying upwind when I flashed the lights and made them think that there was a smell, we expect what's called a surging behavior where the flies increase their velocity until they lose track of the plume. And we actually get a, an interesting surging behavior. So um, similar kind of graph, the red line represents the trajectories of flies that got a real pulse of light and that real fake sense of smell. And the purple ones are control flies that did not receive that. And we do see these flies surge upwind. Um, this initial dip in velocity, we don't know how to describe because this is not something that we see with um, real plume tracking that flies maybe slow down, collect a little bit more information. So we're still exploring exactly what's going on with those flies but we do get our sort of stereotype search result. 
And the last kind of like um, stereotyped uh, olfactory search behavior we can initiate is we can make the flies reduce their altitude in space um, after receiving the pulse, which is what we expect for flies that want to start looking for visual features on the ground. Um, so when we flash these lights and compile all the trajectories, what we find is that the flies that received this sort of like uh, fake smell will actually lower an altitude and start searching for that visual feature like I showed you in the heat map. And so altogether, this is pretty cool. So this is a first proof of concept that one, this optogenetic um, technology, we can actually get to work in a freely flying organism. That's a first um, that no one has really shown before. And we can really start to initiate these stereotyped responses with a very simple, simple stimulus. So as we go forward, we're making the stimuli more complex, more as if they were further from an odor source, so much faster pulses. Um, in more random sequencing, but that's um, not totally critical to the, to the mission of showing that we can kind of create this virtual smell experience for a fly, change its behavior in flight, measure it on sub or sub-second time scales, um, and really see what we expect. So we thought this was pretty cool. Um, and so we thought like, you know, like smell is cool, but we can maybe start exploring other regions of the brain. Um, so what's really convenient about fruit flies is that they have an incredible number of genetic tools to really express any kind of protein, in our case, the red sensitive light channel um, in very specific neuron subpopulations. So we took this one line of flies that will um, express the light sensitive protein in a population of uh, neurons and what exactly these neurons are is not important, but the important part is that they, the neuron bodies start in the brain and they terminate on motor units in the flights in the fly's flight musculature. So um, people in tethered flight and sort of non-free flying experiments have shown that, you know, like if they activate these subpopulations of neurons, it increases how the wing stroke amplitude of a fly. And so I took these flies and I set them up in the wind tunnel um, and I kind of made the trigger a little bit different than the one before. Instead of a plume, I just made a crosswind bar pretty far downwind. So if a fly triggers it, we get as much data as possible before they want to turn around at the upwind section of the wind tunnel. And we can initiate a really sharp acceleration in the fly's flight behavior. Um, so this is still a fairly simple start, but it's really cool that we can sort of uh, externally manipulate neurons in a freely flying fly, show behavioral responses that we expect based off of like sort of the architecture of where those neurons are, where they're terminating on motor units. And the last thing I wanna talk about real quick um, before I start to wrap things up is I was a little bit detail um, brief when I talked about which subset of those sensilli that these experiments are from. So the first set of experiments uh, we expressed in a very specific subpopulation of sensilli, ones that are rule of thumb tend to detect hydrophobic or water insoluble compounds called like the OR uh, receptors. But there's another broad class of these um, sensilla that have a, a different subset of olfactory proteins um, called the IRs, and they tend to detect water-soluble compounds. And this is sort of an evolutionary remnant of when insects had aquatic um, lifestyles. And so one thing that I found really weird is that if I try to do this in this other population of uh, of olfactory receptors, these IR ones, I can't make the flies approach this object at all. I can't make them do it if I flash red lights on them. I can't make them do it if I put a real odor in the wind tunnel arena or anything. And so I thought this was really weird because this is a class of olfactory receptors that's been implicated in olfactory guided search in the literature. Um, so I spent months trying to make this work, like when I was first trying to get even the proof of concept that we can make this work because this, these mutants looked really promising based off of what we had seen in the literature, but we can't make them do this uh, object-oriented, uh, visually guided approach. And I can't make them turn upwind. I can't make them cast or surge. No matter what I do, they seemed unresponsive, which was really weird because we, you know, we did the sequencing. We made sure that these mutants were correct. I did so many controls. But what I ended up finding was that um, because this was so popular in the literature, I made these micro scale wind tunnels to assess the fly's walking behavior. 
Um, so sort of the way they work is that that's a little computer fan. It blows air and we can even put an odor in these things. And each one is sort of set up on its own optogenetic control system with this flashing red light. Um, and what I found is that the walking flies are highly responsive to a uh, the stimulation via the red light activating the subpopulations. So um, that middle graph there is showing that if a, a downwind walking fly experiences its trigger, it shoots straight up wind. But no matter how many times we do this on our control flies, they don't care about the light at all. So we're actually finding that the way that these flies are even taking in smell information is extraordinarily context dependent between whether they're flying or whether they're walking, um, which was a fairly exciting thing, but it's an extra layer of complexity to trying to understand how flies do this over large spatial scales, is that most of the work has been done in walking flies at the neural level, but flying flies appear to behave entirely differently with what they'll even respond to. But I think this result is even a little bit more exciting when we sort of think about this uh, olfactory gated object approach um, within its conservation within diptera. So mosquitoes also require both visual and smell information in order to approach a target to bite it. And somehow in fruit flies, we've managed entirely, we found some circuit that will turn off this uh, vision guided behavior. We don't really have any sort of mechanistic detail yet. I just know that I can, no matter what I do, if I give these flies any amount of red light, they will never ever approach the object. Um, and so I think this is maybe potentially exciting as a way of saying like, oh, we may have an interesting circuit to target to prevent mosquitoes from approaching and biting people. But I'm a comparative physiologist by nature. So I like to be a little bit realistic with the way I pick and think about organisms. So the way I like to describe this to my lab is a fruit fly is similar to the mosquito in the way a marmoset is similar to an orca. So you have to be very careful with like how we sort of start to think about these um, phylogenetic approaches. I think Drosophila and mosquitoes are about 250 million years removed. And that's a lot of time for evolution, especially of these olfaction guided behaviors. But it is something that's on my radar to start to think about as I'm kind of moving forward with this project is that we have this system that may be able to turn off this object or uh, oriented approach. And so some general take homes is we built this wind tunnel system. We can initiate uh, olfactory stereotype search behaviors without using any sort of chemical. We do it entirely with the optogenetics. And this allows us to very finely tune control the exact stimulus we put into a freely flying insect. Um, we found that we can mess around with the neuromechanics of freely flying flies um, by activating this in other brain regions. And we're starting to find some really interesting differences between the way walking flies will respond to different stimuli as compared to freely flying flies. And so on that note, I will take questions, comments, uh, whatever y'all have.